Hey, welcome to True Hope Online. We are so glad that you are here. Here at True Hope Church, we exist to help people find their way back to God here in Spokane, Washington, and all around the world. Whether you attend True Hope, are new to True Hope, or just checking us out, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. Make sure you go to truehopechurch.org slash connect, fill out that form, and we would love to reach out and say hello. You can also find the sermon notes for today's message by downloading the True Hope app in the App Store and can follow along with the message. And lastly, make sure you go to truehopechurch.org slash weekly to sign up for the True Hope Weekly, which is all news, events, information you want to know about pertaining to True Hope Church. Let's now prepare our hearts and jump into the message. Morning, how you doing? Good to see you. Glad you are here today. My name is Ryan, the lead pastor here at True Hope. Happy September. The rain is with us. Mm. It's awesome. Hey, I just want to give a quick church family uh, update on our wildfire response. Thank you so much for your generosity, church, uh, giving to not only the community effort and response, but also to this particular families in our church who lost homes, we have been able to get funds uh, to those families and help them. And what will be a long process of recovery. We'll have more things uh, to do coming forward. There are more ways we can help practically. Uh, but thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus, just being able to talk with those families. Uh, obviously, it's an emotional, difficult, disorienting time, but all of them have said they've just felt uh, the support and care of their church family. And so I just want you to know that. And thank you uh, for your generosity and your care and support. Stuff happens in life we can't predict. And one of the beautiful things is, and I really believe this, it's, it's impossible to go through life without unexpected pain or difficulty. And the way people do that without the hope of the gospel and the care and love of the people of God um, is ill-advised. It's ill-advised. Uh, you, can, you can probably do it. You know, someone would probably stand up here and argue with me and say, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in this gospel um, and I'm making it. And, and I just want to say it's ill-advised. God has put uh, his, his word uh, clearly towards us to center our confidence in him and eternal life. And he's also given uh, us his, his church, his people, and we're the hands and feet of Jesus one to another. So it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Today we're continuing in Genesis uh, we've been looking at the life of Jacob. We'll continue doing so. Uh, admittedly, today is the chapter 29, the Genesis, Genesis chapter 29. That, that's, um, I've never preached it. Um, it's, like, it's like a soap opera. It's like a love story with some really uh, powerful illustrations for us to reckon with. So we're going to see Jacob finally getting to Haran, to his mother's family's tribe, he finally gets there, and we're going to see his interactions with some shepherds, uh, with Laban in particular, and then, of course, his two daughters, Leah and Rachel, who end up being given to Jacob as wives in marriage. And I just want to give you this little precursor, okay? I say this a lot. I'm a broken record, but what they say is it's like the 7th or 10th or 410th time a pastor says something that people in the church actually hear it. So here we go. The Bible describes all sorts of events. That does not mean God is prescribing every element of it. We're going to see polygamy right here in the text. That's married to multiple spouses. And uh, it's already been established. It's not the first time it's in the Bible. But it's already been established that this is a human invention aside from God's original design and purpose. Jesus echoes this in the New Testament. It's also very clear in Genesis chapter 2 what God designed and intends for humanity. But as is the case, humanity goes our own way, and we'll see that in a multiplicity of ways today. I've titled this message, if you're taking notes, it's in the app, you'll see it there. If you're writing it down on some paper, Jacob and Laban, the story of our lives. 
This past week, Kyle, our music pastor who led us this morning, leapt in gregarious response to the question I asked the staff as I walked down the hall of our offices, wondering, isn't there a soap opera series named The Story of Our Lives? And Kyle quickly corrected me and said, <clears throat> it's the days of our lives. <laughs> Within a minute, he pulled up the theme song for me to listen to. I'm hoping that was because he searched it on Google and it wasn't in his Netflix history. <laughs> and the refrain goes like this, as sand through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. <laughs> now, if you're wondering if I have like, I, that's not a firsthand experience thing. I've not watched this show, but I remember the title of this soap. My wife actually filled me in. She's like, oh, I used to watch that with my grandma growing up. I thought, oh, she said they would bake snickerdoodles and watch these soaps. Is that, is that right? That's amazing. <laughs> that, that's a family tradition we're not passing on to our children. <laughs> but, you know, no judgment. Actually, some judgment. So, <laughs> But the phrase is interesting in the beginning of this soap. As sand through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. And it causes me to reflect on that phrase, the days of our lives, or the story of our lives. This is a true statement, I think, at a surface level. As sand goes through an hourglass and eventually it's all done, so are the days of our lives. And there's interesting parts and boring parts and exciting parts and natural parts and supernatural parts and all sorts of things. And then it's over. But that's not God's perspective. That's not what we're invited into. There's a more hopeful, more meaningful way to approach the days of your life, the story of your life, than what the soaps would tell us. I mean, on a serious note, what gives your life meaning? What gives you meaning? What makes your life more than just day after day pouring forward like sand through an hourglass, eventually just ending in seeming insignificance? We can know from the biblical record that there's these great high points in these characters' lives. And Abraham and Sarah and, and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah and Rachel, which we'll see, and Laban, we'll see these high points. And some of them are just confusing. Some of them leave us scratching our heads on why they're in the biblical record. I feel a little bit like this might be one of those sections of Scripture. But, but what I want to contend today is this. If we zoom out and look up, and here's the theme, ready? If we let go of always trying to seize control of our days and our story, I think we can find joyful meaning in every season. Today, I think the question I'm wrestling with, and I want to invite you into it, is this. Who is writing the story of the days of your life? Who is writing the story? Because I think that's what gives it significance. Let's pray, and then we'll jump in. I know some of you, if you've never read Genesis 29, you're just, you're stoked. You're wondering why we didn't pass out snickerdoodles. Well, <laughs> sorry, let's pray. Father, help us today as we look at your word to see you, your truth, your character, your promises, your presence. Help us also to bring honestly our lives, the ups, the downs, the valleys, the mountaintops, bring them before you and surrender. And, and, and find our significance in you and your story and what you're doing in the world. God, I pray uh, that you would help us get to the root, to the heart of what keeps us from experiencing your joy in the days of our lives and the stories of our lives in every season. Help us today. Holy Spirit, we are desperate. We need you to come and remind us of the hope we have in Christ. Remind us of your presence with us in every season and to empower us to live out the purpose and calling God has on each of our lives. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Everyone said, amen. Here we go. Genesis 29. Should be fun. 30 verses. Let's do it. Then Jacob went on his journey. So he was at Bethel and we had that incredible dream. We talked about that last week. Stairway from heaven, in my view, not to heaven. And he comes to the land of the people of the east. And as he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well 
and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. You might be wondering why. Probably because they didn't want other animals to get caught in the well because it was their water and they didn't want to share it. They didn't want to lose access to this. So there's this heavy stone on top of this well. Verse 4, Jacob comes to them and says to them, My brothers, where do you come from? And they said, we are from Haran. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. He said to them, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and pasture them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. Here's, here's why. It was tremendously heavy. And so they'd wait for multiple shepherds of multiple flocks to come together and they'd team effort this thing to get it off the top so they could water their flocks. So verse nine, here comes the soaps. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. <laughs> I wish when I did that, that was more convincing. A lot of you are like, so listen, he has this incredible feat of strength and takes this stone off this well, and he sees Rachel, and he's fired up. Look what happens here, verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. Now, just slow down. Not, not our culture. This is not a, at least outwardly to everyone present, a romantic kiss. Now, it may have been in his mind, okay, because he's smitten by her, and we'll see this, but but this is a greeting, and so he greets her, and he weeps because he's finally found his kin. Verse 12, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and so she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him, here's your proof, and kissed him and brought him to his house. So it's this reunion of sorts. They're meeting one another and their, their long connection to their ancestors. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Now, in this month, some important things transpire. We're getting the high notes here of this story. By the way, just a little update, uh, just to give you context. Jacob ends up here in Haran for 20 years. Okay. So here's kind of the high notes. J Laban turns to Jacob and says, Because you're my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. In other words, you're not my slave. I'm going to pay you. How shall I pay you? How would you like to be paid? Verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak. I'll return to that. But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. So he tells Laban, I'll work for seven years for your daughter's hand in marriage. Verse 19, Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. Translation, I agree, let's make a deal. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Okay. <laughs> Verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. He wants to get married. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. We'll find out next chapter next week why that little aside is important. Verse 25, in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, 
What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one. Understand that this way. The marriage week, this this connection and marriage to her for a week. Don't just like give up. And we'll give you the other one, that's Rachel, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. He completed the marriage week with Leah. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Another aside, Laban gave his female servant Bilkah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. We'll find out about that next week. Just just if you're like so curious, so It's because of the 12 sons of Israel come from these wives and their servants. Verse 30. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Now you understand the purpose for the soap opera illustration. When you look at this passage of Scripture, it can be head-scratching. There's some very important elements of the story here that I want to connect the dots for, but it's also illustrating an important part of life, marriage and romance, it's, in, it's, it's showing us the working elements of life, these in-between, seemingly natural, maybe not supernatural events, but how they still matter to God, how there's still purpose behind all of this if we see it the right way. Let me give you the background information that helps understand why this is in the story of Genesis. These events give us the background to the main plot and story, which is that Jacob is the chosen patriarch from Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, and he would have 12 sons, and those 12 sons would become the 12 tribes of Israel, and Israel would be the nation God would choose and use to bring about the promised seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who in turn will offer his life so that all nations may find hope, and healing, and salvation, and forgiveness in His name alone. That's why this is here. But it's fascinating, this story, and the seven years, and the trickery, and the arranged marriages as this culture operated. The question as we look at this text is, okay, fine, I understand why probably Moses, that's who I think, put this together and wrote this down for the history of Israel so they would understand their story and where they came from and how we would know later in the New Testament leads to Christ. But this story on an application for our daily lived lives is a little bit tougher nut to crack. I mean, honestly, if I turned the tables and handed the text to you, And it's Genesis 29, and come teach the word of God to the people of God on two arranged marriages. A guy who got so drunk, he didn't know who he was consummating marriage with. A father who tricked him. And then he serves another seven years. What in the world do we have to say? But I like that this is in the Bible, and here's why I like it. Because it helps us make sense of all the weird little turns in our life, that if we could write the story, we would write out. We wouldn't have them in our stories. But here it is, and we get to reckon with it. So as we usually do, let's look at what we think we see God doing in this and what humanity is doing or experiencing in the story to help us understand what it means for us. Here's the first thing I want you to see in the 29th chapter of Genesis. God is providentially guiding Jacob's life and story. In a translation for you, if you are his, he's also providentially guiding your life and story. I don't mean writing certain every little event in your life that you choose to do. It doesn't look like him or is deceitful or wicked. I mean, God is providing and guiding us, and in this sense, Jacob, towards his purpose. There's evidence of this in this story. First, that Jacob, after he leaves his place with his family and goes to find his uh, mother's side of the family, he actually finds somebody. He finds them around this well and these shepherds and he asks them, who are you and where are you from? And they say, Haran. He says, do you know Laban? I'm like, we do. The fact that he found them indicates God is providential over his story. And yes, 
the fact that he had some sort of feat of superhuman strength to pull this stone off a well also indicates that God is with him. I personally don't think this is merely a high testosterone moment. I don't think he, oh man, Rachel, she's awesome, like gladiator showing off. I don't, I think this is a subtle hint in the text that God is with him and those shepherds would know that and they'd be like, whoa, we should go back and tell Laban who this guy is, that, that, that Jacob is here. Here's the idea. We don't always recognize God's providence. I'm not sure Jacob would say he recognized it until much later in his life. You know what? It's true in your life and mine. God is providential and he's guiding and directing and leading and superintending over our lives if we're in Christ. And it's not always easy to know in the moment of families who've lost homes to fire. We have people who've experienced loss relationally or in work or in their health or some change they didn't foresee. And it's difficult to say, yep, that's, that's, that's God's part of the story. He wants to write. But when we look back, we can often see the providence of God. The second thing I want you to see about this story, and this is on the human side, Jacob is experiencing a taste of his own medicine. You remember Jacob? The supplanter, the deceiver, the one who tricks his brother when he's super tired and super weary to give him his birthright and he trades it out for a bowl of porridge. The same guy who goes to his father, puts skins on his body and, and tricks him and like lies to him straight out in order to deceive. Jacob here experiences his own medicine. Jacob, in this story, as he gets to Haran, is welcomed into this family and he agrees to work for wages. The wages, of course, being the marriage of Rachel, the youngest daughter of Laban. So as he's working for these seven years, which feel like days to him, here's partly why. Traditionally in this culture, a betrothed husband bring a dowry of wealth or property and give it to the bride's family. He doesn't have that. He has nothing. So he's working for her hand. And as he does this, his days are flying through the hourglass. Also, what happens here is Laban tricks him and deceives him. Now, again, some of you reading this text, if it's for the first time or it's for a revisiting time, you're asking the question we're all asking, which is, how dull is Jacob? <laughs> again, probably a sufficient amount of alcohol was involved to dull his senses also probably, because this was customary, the use of a veil. So there was a significant covering for what would be the wife. And notice in the story it says, after the feast, at the end of the feast, Laban does a swap, Leah instead of Rachel. And so now they consummate marriage. He wakes up, realizes it's Leah, it's not Rachel. And you may ask, well, whatever, just move on. No, 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 no. When this has happened and they have consummated the marriage. It would be worse to discard her than to keep her. And so they make room for an additional wife. Again, in this culture, not God's prescription, but a description of what they were doing. And so then he agrees, why did you do this? Laban lies, I think, or maybe, maybe it was cultural custom. But hey, in our country, we would never do that. We would never give the younger before the older. Notice the irony here in Jacob's story, being the younger with Esau being the older. He's getting the flip side service of his deception. And he's having to eat this dish. So they finish the week of marriage and then he gets Rachel as well. And they consummate that marriage. And then he works for seven more years to pay off the debt. For Rachel. So he works to earn the wages for a wife. It ends up being Leah. Then he receives Rachel soon after, but works seven years to pay off the debt of receiving Rachel as a wife. Now, this was such a mess. If you're just curious, like, see, this is what I don't like about the Bible. It's got so many, like, double standards in it. Let me make something clear for you. Moses wrote about and forbid this very thing later in Leviticus. Leviticus 18 verse 18 says this, And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister. 
uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. Translation, this was a bad idea. But even in the midst of this bad idea, and we'll see this next chapter, God is bringing about his purpose. A third thing I want you to see in this story, God sees us in our pain. Now, when we read the Bible, when I teach the scriptures, we all tend to imagine the Bible from our most readily and easily relatable point of view. So if you're here today and you're like, I got a ton of land and I'm looking for cheap labor, you might think about this text through the lens of Laban. I really hope you're not, but you could be. Or if you're here today and you're a man, as a woman you love, you're hearing this story through the lens of wanting to pursue a wife. But if you're here and you're a woman and you're reading this story, it's probably be pretty frustrating. And I just want to make this point. Yes, in a culture that was uh, tremendously misogynistic, in a culture that regarded women as less than, not God's design, not God's purpose, but in the culture surrounding uh, this beginning covenant people of God, you definitely see this, but I want to highlight this. God sees Leah. Imagine being Leah. When I, when I read this story, I just go, yeah, I mean, it's like messy, it's confusing, it's like a whole different culture, it's deceptive, it's a little bit of like Jacob's reaping what he's sown. But I also zoom in on Leah and just feel like, man, what would it feel like to be the one that wasn't picked, the one that was substituted in late, the one that when he was actually sober, he didn't want. And then you'll see next chapter, I won't give you all the details. We'll he, 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 Jacob does not appreciate Leah the way he appreciates Rachel. And here's the crazy thing. God sees her and he sees it. And she experiences some blessings. She's not perfect. You'll see that next chapter. But God sees us in our pain. This is a theme, I think, of Jacob's story. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, and, I, and, and I, I think it's recurring on purpose. God sees us in our pain. God knows right where we are, just like he knew with Hagar and her son Ishmael. God sees us, and he cares for us, even when the things around us are a mess. Now, this is what we see with God and humanity in the text. What are the takeaways? How does this text and these points serve to speak to us in our stories and in, yes, the days of our lives. I think these are important, and I think, surprisingly, this is a very significant message. I think it's subtle. Please tune in. I think it's as subtle, and you might be tempted to dismiss how significant the subtlety is, but please, I pray that God would show you and show me how significant this is. Here's the first takeaway. God works in us as intently as he works through us. God is going to work through Jacob, through these patriarchs and their families. But that doesn't mean God's also not going to work in them. And what I mean by working in them is rearranging their affections and their hearts and their desires in the dark places. God's going to do stuff through them. Their names will be in a great story. But... He also wants to work in them, to heal them, to reform them, to refine them. And often, this happens through pain. I know for certain, this happens through deep surrender. So much of God working in humanity is about humanity surrendering control when what we want to do is seize control. This is so clearly seen in Jacob's story. Jacob seizes control. A word has been spoken that the promise will go to him, but he seizes control and tricks his brother to get his birthright. He seizes control at the instruction of his mother, who's also seizing control, Rebecca, to manipulate his father to get the blessing. Similarly, Laban is seizing control of cheap labor. 
of a kinsman who comes from afar and really wants to marry his youngest daughter. And he's going to get seven years of labor out of this. And he's going to give him Leah, which will solve some problems. Uh, well, there's, there's one of my daughters married off. And I know you want the other one. So how many more years are you going to give me? Seven more. Seizing control is the temptation of humanity when the invitation that God has for us is to surrender to him so he can work in us, in our hearts, in our lives. I want to draw your attention to a psalm, Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12. Ultimately, friends, the way to surrender is to believe this truth. God owns everything. Verse 10 of Psalm 50, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. And I love this phrase. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. God owns everything. I believe it was Abraham Kuyper, theologian, who said there's not a square inch anywhere in this universe that the creator does not scream, mine. God owns it all. God owns your story. God owns your life. I don't agree. Then just run against him until your eyes close and you will see who you face and who you give account to. He owns every breath, every life, he owns every speck of this universe that he has created. Your days slipping through the hourglass, seemingly insignificant, he owns those. Your story, your stuff, your life, God owns it all. And you might be thinking, Ryan, how is that good news? The great news about God is though he owns it all, he does not hoard it all. He shares it and calls us to steward our days, our moments, our seasons, our failures, our victories, our exciting high points and our depressing low points. God owns it all. And when you and I accept this, it opens the door for God to work in us, as he knows he will work through us. Here's the second big thing I want you to see that's a takeaway from this peculiar story that on the surface reads like a soap opera, but underneath it gives us an invitation to the God of purpose. Second thing, God invites us to be in his story, and this is a sure pathway to joyful meaning. Let me elucidate this point carefully because I think this point is subtle but significant. If God owns it all, then his invitation to you and me in our seasons and even in our very days means that we should embrace the servant role of experiencing his redemption of our stories. The temptation is to abandon the God of our stories, our days, because we don't like the way the story is going. This is one of the greatest hurdles to faith. God, I don't like this season. I don't like this event. I don't like this situation. But here's the truth. We are tempted to make the point of our lives an invitation for God to come enjoy a guest appearance role in our small little lives. In other words, we're obsessed with trying to figure out how God can get in my story when the invitation of Scripture, the invitation of the gospel, is you are invited to find your role, your place, in God's great story. And this gives you and me joyful meaning, even in the dullest of days. 
even in the valleys, even in the pain. These are two significantly different ways to approach life. God, get in my story. Or, God, where do you want to deploy me in your story? These are two very different ways to think about life. And here's the danger when we don't understand this. We make our personal stories and our personal days the chief ends of our lives. And the danger here is this. Your story and my story, if we're not careful without the filter and lens of God's story, it becomes a distortion of reality. It becomes our ever constant pursuit of our own significance. God's story is the real story. His story is the significant story. And even if we have a small part in his story, we will serve the greater purpose of pleasing him and glorifying him as the creator. And here's the cliff notes. That's the most important thing that creatures can experience is the significance of glorifying God. God reveals himself to us in the days of our lives, in the ups, in the downs, his faithfulness, his presence, his promises. They hold us, they buoy us, they spur us forward, they give us perspective. And when we realize that our lives aren't needing to bear the weight of being great, we can simply serve God and his story, which is great. We experience profound meaning and contentment. It was 2019. We were teaching through Ecclesiastes. There was a thirst and an interest and a hunger in this church towards that peculiar book of the Bible like I had not seen in many years of teaching through Scripture. And I think one of the reasons is is because this point is significant. We are being told, make your life great. And the scriptural invitation, the gospel invitation is, you don't need to bear that weight. Come and join the story of God. And it enables us in our ups and downs to endure. There's a quote from an author, Bill Clem. I read this book called Disciple with a handful of men early on in True Up Church's journey. There's a handful of you here who probably remember this. And here's Bill Clem's quote on this idea of our story and God's story. He says, as long as we think we're writing our own story, we will keep adding adventures or characters, thinking that more is the pathway to meaning and happiness. Here's the problem. We just don't have enough resources to get to the meaning we crave. We can't write a story big enough. I can't win enough lotteries. I can't make enough money. I can't have enough insane adventures. I can't fill enough Instagram reels to have everybody think that my life is the best life you could ever live. I just don't have it in me. And I think we're exhausted. And for those in the older generations, we need your wisdom and perspective because my generation in down is consumed with this narrative. There's so much potential out there. How will I make my life great? And how will I make my meaning significant? And we'll do all sorts of stupid things. We'll like wonder if there's 47 genders and which one would suit us the best. We'll wonder what, you know, we, we could change careers 42 times in a life. We'll imagine we can just move to this city or this state or marry that person and divorce this one and get a new one and trade this out and push that out and learn a new thing. And while some of those things, very few of them are neutral, the driving pursuit is I just got to write a new story and put some more characters and keep writing my story. So hopefully at the end when someone stands behind a lectern and my body's in a box or it's in an urn, something about me mattered. And I look at this story and I go, this is a weird part of the story. Trixie Jacob got tricked by Laban. Poor Leah. I mean, probably poor Rachel too. What a mess. And yet it's here and it's, it's messy, 
but it's a part of a way bigger tapestry that eventually leads to the Messiah. That invitation is available to us. Here's a couple questions I'll end with, just two questions. I want you to think about this. So take this thought. I know it's a little bit abstract, and I want to put it on the ground. And here's how I'm going to do it. Just two questions. Which part of your story do you currently wish you could rewrite? Which part are you like, you know what? If you gave me the pen, I'd go back there and and I'd rewrite it. I understand that. In our perspective, it's like I could do so much better if that part wasn't there. But let me just help you for a second. You can't go back. You can't. And I'm not saying that whatever's written back there, no matter how painful and shameful and potentially abusive or confusing it is, that God's like, yeah, I rendered that certain. That's a big old theological debate that I can't figure out. Where the complex sovereignty of God intersects with human responsibility and behavior and action. What I do know is I can't go back, but God is so good. He offers us now the gift of surrender. I'm just going to let that go. That happened I did that. That's a part of my story. But I'm entering the servant, humble role of giving my story to God. I'm entering into his story, and he's redeeming. The second question is, which part of your future story are you withholding the pen from God? If You guys, God's writing this story. Which part of the future are you going, nope? Nope. I'm not giving up control. God, you're not, nope, not in that area, not in my finances, not in my job, not in my marriage, not there, nope, 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 nope. Which parts of your life have you knowingly or unknowingly, hopefully now knowingly as the Spirit of God begins to work on us, have you said, mine? And God is saying to you today, there's not an inch of this universe that actually isn't mine. I invite you to surrender. If there's a call to action, if there's a theme of this sermon, it's surrender. Your story and my story surrendered to God, the parts that are frustrating, painful, and in the past, the parts that are scary and uncertain in the future. Our stories surrendered to God, giving up this idea we can make them great and entering into his story as servants is freedom. It is joyful meaning. It's the only way that our days, the days of our lives, are not just manageable, but they're joyful. They're joyful because we give it to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, right now in Jesus' name, God, I pray you would help us answer these questions. Holy Spirit, help us right now. God, bring to our attention the parts of our past we wish we could rewrite. And God, in this practice, help us to present our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, to surrender, knowing that you're merciful, that you're good, that you can work all things according to the good of those who are called according to your purpose. God, I pray for those of us who have dreams, hopes, aspirations, things we're wondering about what is still to come. Help us with open hands to walk into every day you invite us into going forward. God, help us to cease the obsessive invitation to get you in our story and instead respond to your invitation to join yours. We surrender all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, we want to thank you so much for tuning in to the message. We really believe that God is working and has purpose in you tuning in with us. And we want to encourage you, if you have taken a step and given your life to Jesus in watching this message, or you have questions about faith and giving your life to Jesus, we would love to talk with you. And so make sure you go to truehopechurch.org slash next steps and we can reach out to connect and talk with you. That's also a great spot to go if you're desiring to take next steps like baptism or serving or getting plugged into a group. We also know life is challenging 
And if you need prayer for something, we would love to pray with you, pray for you. Make sure you go to truehopechurch.org slash prayer to get prayer. Lastly, if you would like to give to the mission of God here at True Hope Church and support what God is doing, you can give through the app or by texting any dollar amount to 84321. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to stay connected via the app, YouTube, and our social media like Instagram. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.